Hello, and welcome to our podcast for economics that we are calling Demand and the Law of Demand. I would imagine that many people who are thinking about economics or thinking about studying it tend to think of the concept of supply and demand. And yes, this definitely plays a role in that, but we're able to separate those two things out a little bit into supply and then separate from that demand. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about here. So consider the following sentence. I demand that you follow directions. What does that actually mean? It means I want you to follow directions. I need you to. I'm kind of ordering you. It's very emphatic. It's very powerful. I need you to do this. If just in general, demand means I need something, I want something. In economics, it's very similar. In economics, we define demand as the pull to want or to need something. So technically, this is from the consumer's end, the person who might be buying something end. It is their desire and their willingness to pay a price for some good or for some service. So from the buyer's end, they have a demand for something. They feel they need something. They feel they want something. That is demand. So think about it. What would you pay for water? How much do you demand water? On a day-to-day -day basis, you might not pay anything for it because you could get it from your kitchen sink, your Brita filter or something in your refrigerator. You get it from a water fountain. And so we might not pay very much for it. Although we need water, as we've talked about in previous podcasts, and we demand it because of the economics surrounding that, for the most part, we don't need to pay very much for it in our society. What would you pay for an iPhone? How much do you demand an iPhone? How much is the pull on you asking you say, yes, I got to have it. I need it. I want it. I demand it. So consider how much pull is on you to buy that product. And so that pull on a consumer is what we call demand. And so again, just to illustrate the concept of demand and as we will talk about in a minute, the law of demand, that is on the consumer's end, on the customer's end. The customer wants something. How much is it pulling that person to buy this product? Demand is not from the supplier's end, from the store's end. Demand is from the buyer's end. So here we get into the specifics of this. If demand is from the consumer's end, the person who has the money, who might potentially spend it on something, then it seems like demand needs to be created. Now, sometimes demand is just natural. Like we need those things at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. We need food and water, and we're going to demand those. We are going to spend money on those. We're going to get those in some way. The demand for those is basic. But as we move up the pyramid of Maslow, those things become a little bit different. Do we need the new car? Do we need the Ferrari, the iPhone, the diamond ring, the fur coat, etc.? Therefore, for some of us, the demand for those things is not all that high, whereas for other people, it might be higher. So if demand is from the buyer's end, how does anything actually get bought? Oftentimes, stores will work a way to create demand in their customers. They will create an atmosphere through advertising, through the way they sell things that will create an atmosphere where all of a sudden somebody's going to be like, hey, I need that thing right now. So stores are going to crank up the pressure and create demand from the buyer's end. And so take a look at some of these ads. How are they creating demand in their customers? They're putting pressure on them saying, hey, if you want this great deal on a piece of jewelry, you've only got three days to do it. So you better hurry. Oh man, it's, you know, it's Monday. I, I didn't really need a diamond ring, but all of a sudden on the Friday after Thanksgiving, I need it. And what's helping drive that demand is probably this flyer, this pressure that people are putting on consumers. We can offer percentages off. Well, I didn't really need that thing, but now that it's 75% off, all of a sudden I need the sham wow. Who knew? And so all of a sudden, demand is being manipulated. And again, demand is from the buyer's end, but it is also being influenced by the seller because they're trying to create that demand for their product. And so they'll find all kinds of different ways to create demand in consumers' lives. So throughout my lifetime, and I'm sure as you'll see throughout yours, there are certain items that all of a sudden people feel like they need and they will fight for them. Two days before they came out, nobody even heard of them, nobody even wanted them, no big deal. And then all of a sudden they got exceptionally popular and everybody needed to have them. So here are some examples of those high demand items. In the upper left, we get the Cabbage Patch Kids. 
in the 1980s, people were running each other over and, and almost killing each other to get these dolls right around the Christmas time. The Tickle Me Elmo a couple years ago, Teddy Ruxpin, which was like a talking teddy bear, the Furbies, the Transformers, and probably most recently the idea of the Rainbow Loom. This goofy little plastic frame where goofy little plastic things would be wrapped around it and people could make bracelets and necklaces and all kinds of things like that. Nobody had ever heard of this. And then all of a sudden it comes out and it seems like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. The company has made demand and the consumers have responded all of a sudden everybody wants it demand is high every kid is out there nagging their parent i need the rainbow loom tomorrow everybody's got it i need to have it too we also have examples of where demand gets exceptionally manipulated and where we think about all of a sudden how much we feel like we need something for example in the upper left the demand for food at a ball game of any kind is exceptionally high. You're hanging out for a couple hours, you gotta have the nachos because that's just what you do. But you can't bring food in. So the demand for nachos from their concession stand is exceptionally high. It's the only place you can get it. It's the only game in town. Same thing with the bottom right, a restaurant in an airport. Since you can only bring certain things through security anymore, and you, it's difficult to bring liquids, water, whatever, People are going to need water beyond security. So the demand for it is exceptionally high. And that's one of those basic needs. The water fountain can only serve so much. And if you didn't bring a water bottle to put it in, you're going to have to buy it. And therefore, the airport has you. The demand for water is high. You're ready to spend whatever it takes to get that water in that enclosed environment. And you're spending $6 for a small bottle all of a sudden. Other examples. Upper right. All of a sudden it starts snowing, your car doesn't have four-wheel drive or good snow tires on it, and you demand and you need and you want chains on your tires. Therefore, any place that sells chains near a mountain pass or near a mountain pass on a day when it's snowing, the demand is high. Same thing with the bottom left. If you have a massive flood come through like we did in Boulder a couple years ago, the demand for sump pumps is ridiculous. Home Depot runs out, Lowe's runs out, every single mom and pop hardware store runs out because all of a sudden consumers feel they need it and they are exercising the economic concept of demand. So that is the concept of demand, just that the consumer feels this pull to purchase something, to spend money on something. Here is the general rule or the law of demand that relates to that. As prices for goods or services go up, the quantity that people are willing and able to buy declines, said in another way. If prices go up for some reason, demand will go down. Because think about it. Yes, I need a new computer. I'm demanding it. My old one has blown up. It is ridiculous. I've got to have a new one in order to do my job. Well, if all of a sudden the prices jump from $1,000 to $5,000, oh, okay, all right, hang on a second. I'll find another way to get this job done. Maybe I'll just work at work. I won't take my work home with me. I'll do it somewhere else. I'll go to the public library where they have a computer. I'll borrow a friend's. I'll buy a different kind of computer. But if prices go up, demand is going to go down. And now the inverse of that. If prices go down, then all of a sudden people's demand goes up. Oh my goodness. That $200 iPod is now 50 bucks for some reason. I so need it. I've got to have that. I didn't need it before when it was 200, but if it's gonna be 50, I could totally find a use for that. So we start to see the law of demand, where if prices go up, demand is gonna go down. People aren't gonna need it. Vice versa, if prices go down, then demand will go up. And so here is that typical demand graph. You can see across the bottom, the independent variable of quantity. So it's just however much there is. On the left-hand side, I don't have a lot of something. On the right-hand side, it increases the quantity. I've got a lot of it. On the left-hand side, the vertical axis, you can see price people are willing to pay. If I have a lot of something, like where the D is on the graph, I have a lot of it, people are only willing to pay a little bit for it. It's like, eh, it's everywhere. There's no rush. I could totally get this tomorrow or find another bot. Find another company or find another brand. There's tons of it. The demand is low. But like we had said, if the quantity is very low, 
then the price is going to be very high because it's going to create a lot of demand. Oh my God, there's only five left. I better get it today. I'm willing to outbid the kid sitting next to me in order to get this silly item. So if there's a few left, the demand increases, the pressure to buy increases, and all of a sudden people are willing to pay a lot for something because they think it might be the last one ever. And so here we have what we call a demand shift. The entire graph can shift to the left or the right based on the sociological need to have demand that pull from the market in order to buy something. If we have more of something, it's going to change how that demand looks. If we have less of something, that demand is going to change. And so from the consumers and the person willing to spend the money, we have demand. If we manipulate some of those factors, our graph is going to shift to the left or to the right to represent the effect of that change. So that's about it in terms of the economic term of demand and the law of demand. So just remember that demand is from the consumer's end. It's this economic pull, this sociological need to fit in, to get something, to buy something, this pull to spend money from the consumer's end. And so there are many factors that can influence demand though, whether something is cheap today, different competitive good, what my expectations are, taste, that kind of stuff. And then we have the idea of the law of demand, that if we change some of those factors, what happens to the demand? Is that graph going to shift to the right, where all of a sudden people are like, yes, I've gotta have it? Or is that graph going to shift to the left where it's like, eh, I don't need that so badly today. I can wait a day and pick it up later. Those are the two things we need you guys to know. We'll be adding the concept of supply and the law of supply next. And then, of course, we'll put those two together to get that very famous concept of supply and demand, which everybody thinks is the cornerstone of economics. So, as always, if you have any questions, please bring those into class. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.